Uh, yeah, Vincent, thanks so much for joining us today. I've been a fan of your work for a while now, following you on Vimeo and watching your channel constantly grow and your work progress as well. Um, for people that haven't seen your work, can you kind of give us a rundown on who you are and what you do? So, well, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's an honor. Um, my videos are basically just some sort of uh, travel videos, funny, fast cut travel videos about um, trips I, I did with my friends. Um, that's what I did for the past few years. Now I'm doing a bit more of commercial work, um, but in the same vein, I do work for um, some tourism agencies or other brands that are involved with tourism um, and doing these kinds of films, which are really hard to describe, I would say, just by words. Totally. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I think you, yeah, you really have to watch it. I'm always trying. It's it's just a very fast-paced music video style um, form of film that also has a lot of audio effects on it, Yeah. Uh, which are kind of popular on Vimeo yeah, right now. The, the interesting stuff with the part that I like about your work is quick cuts are very popular now, right? I mean, you see them, you see those crazy transitions that everyone's doing because everyone has ADD and no one has time to watch a video. So what I respect about your work is you've managed to keep a timeless element to your work. It's not, you're not really doing crazy transitions. Everything seems to be kind of like in camera and uh, not over the top, which I really enjoy. Uh, yeah, I also think for me, it was the other way around. I did this kind of work because I grew up making snowboarding films. And basically what happened there was um, me and my friend who started this company, this snowboarding film company, was our riders or our athletes weren't the best um, in comparison to other bigger productions. So we had to kind of find a, another way how to make our films attractive. So we yeah. were more working for showing the fun aspect of it and cutting to the music and it that, that got quite popular um the way we did it and i kind of just translated that to traveling films at some point yeah and um so these kind of techniques and what we did this this did in close music was always already part of my work before these crazy transition hyperlapse things came into um Popularity. Into fashion, yeah. popularity into fashion. Um, and then I adapted more of it, but it's not like, uh, it's not like one of the, uh, a lot of people on Vimeo right now are just looking at these films that me or D'Alessandria are doing and then just trying to copy the, the techniques yeah. without really thinking about why these transitions would make sense. Okay. It's more of a tech show off. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, and I'm I'm trying to avoid that. I mean, I'm I'm sure I feel fall prey prey to it yeah. every once in a while that it's a little bit too much of fact. Um, but I'm I'm also really trying to make to only use use this if it makes sense. Yeah. Um, to to be pacing in a way that sometimes you have your very quiet moments and then it just rushes into with, with, with a crazy transition. Um, but I can't t really tell you <laughs> why or when that transition makes sense. It's yeah. a, it's a, it's a total gut feeling thing. Yeah. I was going to ask, do you have a background in music at all? Because it seems, it seems like you would, you, you have such a good, or you're so great at timing things and pacing a piece and not overwhelming the audience. So I, I, I played guitar my whole life, but on a very, amateur um level yeah but i, I do have an a definitely an understanding for music um and i think that is as an editor probably the most important thing to have yeah. um and not just in this typical sense that you know where your bars are and where where to put any highlights but also just going with the with the actual emotion of of what's going on in the song. Mm -hmm. it, it's not that you always have to edit on, on a certain beat um, 
because that's kind of simple. You just have to look at the yeah. waveform, yeah. but know when to pick up the pace and, 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 and slow it down. But I can't say that uh, this is a, something I do, um, how to say it, like deliberately. Um, what, yeah, think it's not really I'm thinking about it. It yeah. just so happens. But I, I, I think a, a, a music background certainly helps a yeah. lot. And then, and then just practice and practice and practice, right? Like keep making stuff, realize what, what's working, what's not working. That is, I mean, that's probably the most common question that I get from people on Facebook or whatever, like asking me for their help or how they could improve their their work. And I'm just saying like, I've done this for a very, very long time now. And it was never that I could look up on some of YouTube tutorial that just kind of explains how this is done. It is, I mean, I made so many shitty films in my life. Um, and you learn by them. Yeah, like yeah, you I totally agree. What works. And I think one of the things you you can really only learn by that, and which I always made the mistakes in my early life, is just getting rid of all the shots that are really bad. In the beginning, you're like, oh, I love this because... It has it meaning was such to a, me, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. has meaning to me, but it's getting an object objective view on what is actually good yeah, yeah. is really hard. Yes, I totally and get agree. Your own Something that. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people are missing is realizing how much uh, a viewer is giving up by watching your video and you owe them something. You're taking their time. It's the most precious thing and people think they can put out a 12 minute video and just expect people to watch that and that that's fair and people should come watch it. When it's really the other way, way around, I think people go out of their way to not see your shit. You know, like, I don't think people want to see your films. Like, you have to give them something of value and respect their time. Uh, but... Oh, yeah. Okay. So you... Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, that's a... That's very interesting. I've never heard it phrased in that kind of way, but... Um, <laughs> I, I would certainly agree. It's always, it's always on my mind. Yes, yeah, it's, it's always like, does anybody really want to see this shit? Um, is that really interesting for someone who does not know me or know any of my friends or uh, know anything about the particularities of the trip? You should never expect anybody to read the description of your video, the title of your video, any anything like that. They should be knowing. They should only be watching this film, yeah. and every cut, especially in the beginning, should be deliberate, should make the whole thing interesting, and then they will probably stick around to the end. Yeah. But uh, there's no easy formula. No, exactly, <laughs> but that's what makes it fun, right? <laughs> It is. Uh, no, I mean, especially the, the whole editing process is, is so much fun. Yeah, you uh, seem to me more of an editor than a filmer, right, in terms of what you enjoy? I, yeah, certainly. I yeah. mean, it was my job, too. Th through this whole traveling period, when I started um, the travels in 2009 up to, let's say, 2015, my job was a commercial editor. I did all kinds of edits for um, other directors in the commercial world. This is how I basically got my money okay. and then saved it up to do these private trips. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, it was always my day job. Yeah. So, so, so back in 2009, you were working as a commercial editor and how, how did that work? Would people send you the footage that they shot and kind of give you a description of what they wanted? No. Um, so 2009 basically was the year when I stopped doing the whole snowboarding thing. Uh, just basically almost from one day to the next just said like, no more. Yeah, so if we can touch, and, up, sorry, just touch on the snowboarding quickly, you created this group with your friends, correct? And you started releasing films just for people that don't know. Okay, uh, so yeah. Basically what we had, well, we were, I think 17, 18, around that time, we had a gr group of friends, my very best friends, and we 
started this snowboarding crew. I mean, what people do, like skaters, surfers, yeah. they're like, hey, we're a crew now and we're going to film each other. But everybody filmed each other. It was not that this was my thing in the beginning, but I, I quickly realized that everybody else was a lot better in snowboarding than I was. Um, so it was more and more my thing to, to be filming. Yeah. And also I was kind of the nerd of the group, so I was the only one that has a, had a computer background. So when it came to the editing part, um, I, had, I just started editing something. And it was really fun for me. So, and after we did this first film, just with us as as friends, we got quite a nice reception in the in the German scene. So we just decided to keep on going. And after two three years, we started collecting sponsors and getting better riders, um, better athletes for our snowboarding films. And I think by two thousand four, we had the company. And for five years, that was basically my job. Yeah. Um, and in 2009, it kept on going. Um, the company is called Eason 7. It kept on going for a little while um, with my friend Alex Schiller, who um, kept the brand alive, but I was out. And when I was back in Munich that time, I already had a lot of contacts to these companies like Red Bull, Burton, Oakley, whatsoever. They, they worked with me in the snowboarding field, so I had an easy entry into the, the the working area so and they would sometimes just send me footage as you said yeah um and then i would edit something but um that year i also started actual commercial editing where i'm a, get invited from some director and then you actually like sit with them in a in an editing suite and 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 it's not that you just get some footage from someone randomly and just do whatever you want it's calculated that's it is it's more calculated and is a more a lot more oversight i mean there's a productions and agencies involved and but this is what i um, then did for the next few years um commercial editing uh which is fun yeah um it's nice and uh i think after really after the japan clip which was in 2015 it started off that I got my own, that I got more and more requests to do my own film as a uh, own films as a director. Yeah, and um, I guess since then I'm doing more work like that and getting to edit less and less. Yeah, which unfortunately makes you happy or sad. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's a it's a mixed bag. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, 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 I work with someone, my uh, good friend, Max Neumeyer, who, is, um, who basically started as an intern maybe five or six years ago with me. And I worked with him ever since. And he's kind of doing the same editing now as I do because okay. we always... So um, it works quite well. I have yeah. someone I can trust yeah, and, and don't key. just give it away. Um, but I, I, I look forward to... to Every time I, I do a, a long period of just filming, I'm looking forward to having my time back in the dungeon yeah. and yeah. just I think be they editing. fit each other pretty well. I'd say I'm the same. I, I enjoy editing more, but it's important for me to get out there and shoot because I don't want to be locked inside all day. I want to yeah. go see some stuff. But uh, So those travels that you started in 2009, what prompted that? And you were on some pretty pretty huge trips, right? Yeah. So my best friends who, uh, or best friend who I basically know from birth and I did everything with him my whole life, but he was never really um, that involved in the whole snowboarding thing. So once I got out, um, it was pretty cool that we were saying like, hey, let's do something cool again together. And he's more of a, he's not at all into this filming thing, but he's it's more like the MacGyver type that okay. just builds stuff and very handy like a backcountry engineer kind of thing builds, yeah so builds cars. he he bought himself a land rover defender okay and customized the whole thing to be kind of a travel vehicle as well with like a roof tent and a whole setup um of of a shelving system inside with our own little kitchen so that was pretty cool and we were just sitting in his kitchen um one evening it would a with some maps and try to decide where we wanted to go. So I think 
one of the first ones on the list was China, actually. Yeah. But then we found out it's really complicated to go there with your own car. They're a little particular about the whole subject. Yeah. And then we decided on Southeast Asia. It was quite the learning curve because no one, none of us knew like how to ship a car around the world. I, yeah, I don't know how you'd even <laughs> find that out. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of forums um, from these crazy like world travelers that yeah. you know are basically eight years with their whole family just yeah. traveling the world and, so where and were you some, shipping it from uh we're shipping it from hamburg or the first one was from bremen i think bremen yeah. um to to kuala lumpur in okay. malaysia yeah. and and the intention of this trip was you had did you have any thought as to what you were going to shoot and how big it was going to be or just purely fun not at all it was purely fun i just we just wanted to have a really good time and just travel around of course i was thinking of bringing my camera yeah and then uh, my other good friend who's also a filmmaker clemens kruger um joined the trip after a while he um for the first month he was not with us but he also brought his camera and we filmed a little bit and i i made that mistake that we talked about earlier um for this first trip that i was like okay i'm making this as a travel diary of what we did okay. together so a lot of different episodes of every week yeah and then a little bit of information what we actually did on these trips but it was just uh, it's too much footage and too personal are these uh, the videos that are up in your vimeo though like the the in asia series yeah, it's called the, well, yeah. the funny thing which I did say that earlier, but I mean, those did work out for you, right? And I think people were willing to stick around on videos longer back then, maybe, but they did work and they're, they're still awesome. They are, and, and they're a good memory for me, but it, it, they're nothing in comparison to what, what? we did. Okay. And we, it did a little bit more of a, deliberate attempt because we knew that people liked what we did in Asia with the films mm -hmm. but it was more of a okay this time we really think about filming we really think about w what kind of shots we want to get and I made the decision that we just for a four month total time yeah. just make a five minute video yeah which kind of forces you obviously to be a lot more selective yeah. on what you're showing um, instead of what we did in Asia with like five minutes in total five videos. So that's a, a long time. So you yeah. have a lot of stuff in there that's mediocre at best. Yeah. And the South America one was more condensed. It was easier to watch for people. It was not that personal, um, although still a little bit. But that just really kicked the whole thing off. And, and people were really excited about it. And that was was motivating us to keep on doing this and which also opened a lot of doors for us like to um other travel travel agencies like inviting us to go somewhere to make sure. these films and um so i mean if the if someone is looking for any kind of advice on how to um do that i can only say condense your films yeah, i totally agree <laughs> totally agree and from there you shifted into that format of more condensed films and then you went on as you mentioned to shoot the Japan video uh, for people who haven't seen it definitely check it out on Vimeo it's just look up Japan Vincent Urban and it's what 2.8 million views on Vimeo right now I guess so uh, yeah insane that's the equivalent of 1 billion views on YouTube uh, using the conversion rate <laughs> but uh, yeah so that can kind of condensed version what was the shoot in japan what did your days look like and what was the thinking around that trip before you went it was it more deliberate than your no your not at all that yeah. was uh, actually a very spontaneous one um a friend of mine um alex schiller who was actually the one that i started the whole snowboarding company with okay um he was just really in need of a little break from everything and yeah. just said, hey, he wants to do this trip in a couple of weeks to Japan. He really wants to travel Japan without the snowboarding because we've been there before yeah. for yeah. snowboarding reasons, but never really. And he's a big fan. And he just said, hey, do you want to join in this? And then we asked another friend who's also involved in the whole snowboarding 
um, thing, Alex Tank is his name. And he also said, like, yeah, I have some free time. So very spontaneous. We didn't really think about anything. We got a rail pass, which is really nice. It's something like the what you can do in Europe as well, where you just buy one ticket for the oh, for the cool. train. Oh, cool. That's a great for, idea. For um, two weeks. and then you, Or three we did, actually. And then you just can freely travel around the country. And the Japan rail system is, is amazing. So you can basically go everywhere with that. Um, the thing is, uh, we all were, we all have a camera, we all like, like to film, so we brought it, and it got a little bit more deliberate w once we were there. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I, I usually, when I go on these travels, I'm a bit nerdy anyways, and I'm trying to find out like what places, where to go, and do my little maps, and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and plan everything out, and everyone was kind of involved, so we, we did like get up really early in the morning to like avoid crowds or have better light so yeah. it wasn't wasn't just fun but we we're also like going out and drinking and just having a good time so it is not is really a mixture and it was never intended to be a any kind of commercial success film or whatever but i also had the the, the luck that i went to japan for something commercial afterwards again Okay. And filled a little bit there as well, so I could even gather some more footage oh, for okay. this film. So it's a little bit of mixture of everything, which is, um, which which helped. Yeah. But it's still there. There was never any intention. It was just a private project um, for a fun trip that we had, and I, we had a very very good time. I can only recommend going to Japan to everyone. Yeah, um, I went there the first time. Kind of, first time last yeah. year, actually. Uh, stayed in Tokyo for New Year's for a few days and then went up to the North Island to go skiing. It's it's a crazy place and it's a, so different. Yeah, it's just so interesting. Yeah. But on a, I mean, sometimes weird level as well, but most of the time just on a very enjoyable um, level, I think. I, I, I don't know anything, any other place in the world that is just so different, but at the same time still welcoming. Yeah, it's very welcoming, very organized, and surprisingly peaceful. I'm not a big city person, yep. I wouldn't say. I mean, I live up in Whistler, I live in the mountains. And I, I found Japan to be actually pretty calming, which is was surprised me for 13 million people or however many live there. Yeah, it's not. It's. I mean, it can be stressful after a while with all those, like voices around you i don't know if you notice this is always everything talks to you in the constant in, elevator music throughout the whole uh, yeah. city it's so funny yeah i think that there's that one cut in my film that a lot of people pointed out um which is where the music totally stops and you just hear this music yeah. within a 7-eleven store I and it's that. such a Everyone who went to Japan, I think, knows what this cut is about. Yes, yeah. Because you're entering these little corner stores, 7-Elevens, most, most of the time. And there's this cheesy elevator music inside and just these weird noises all the time. It, it is a very Japanese experience. <laughs> but So let's talk about that cut. Uh, did you have the idea for that while you were there? Because you would have probably needed to intentionally shoot that shot of you kind of walking through that little convenience store. No, it's no. absolutely non-intentional, really? and I did not. I did not um, do the shot. Alex um, took the shot. Alex Schiller, okay. and his. Uh, no, we never uh, intended this to be uh, in the film or whatever. But I mean, after we took the shot, we looked at it and we were just bursting out laughing. It was it was wonderful, and yeah. I knew that I had to do something with it, but. Yeah. It, it took, uh, I mean, I only edited all this stuff like a year later. So it was okay. not, it, it, rarely anything in this Japan film was planned Planned-o, out yeah. in that, that way. So, for example, there's a, there's a long hyperlapse through these red gates. Yes, yeah. That was like at five in the morning. Um, the other two guys were just coming back from karaoke without even sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to be up there before there's masses of tourists at this place in yeah. Kyoto. So oh, yeah. um, we wanted to be up there as the first guest, but we, we, we did not have any plan whatsoever. Okay. And so at some point I was just like, okay, I know this is going to be a lot of red gates. I don't know what to do here, but well, I might just start 
hyperlapse with no idea where this is going. Yeah. And then I didn't even know how long it's going to be. So yeah. I just started basically and, and, and went through with it after an hour. I was just like, fuck, I, hope, I really hope this is, this, this ends at some point. Yeah. And it My ended up being such an fire. important shot in the video. Yeah. It's, and, and yeah, it, it, I mean, but, Honestly, there was no thought behind it. And even when I was at the ending, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to film like how my feet are walking out of this as well. Just maybe I can put it, put it together. I didn't even know if that would work or, or not. I never did anything like that before, but it, yeah. it kind of worked. So. so with this run and gun style that you have, and I would say I, I kind of, I'm more on that side as well, where I, I don't like to plan because I shoot a lot of adventure stuff, surfing, whatever. And there's no point in making a storyboard because who knows, maybe we won't be able to land the plane on the beach because it's too foggy or something like that. So I just, I like to run with it and then uh, kind of work on the story in post-production. But now that you're doing more commercial directing uh, personally, how do you translate that run and gun style when a huge company comes to you and they're like, oh, we want the Vincent Urban effect, uh, but you need to send us a storyboard before. Do you struggle with that? Um, I did a bit in the beginning. Um, they're not really requesting a storyboard, um, but they do want to have a shot list. Um, because, I mean, there's a whole team behind you and you need to plan something. You need to plan where are the people going in the morning, what are they all doing, what kind of equipment are we bringing. So there must be some kind of, some sort of plan yeah. to be had. So, um at le the least uh, I, I, I always do is the location and a general thing that we're doing there. For the most of the Lufthansa films, it was a it was a decent shot shot list. Like okay. a lot of these things were planned out. The plan that we're going diving and these kind of these kind of shots were there. Yeah, and they were thought of um, um, ahead of it. And it's also I real realize it's and I will do some of it in the future um, because it just it just helps you to, to, to be a little bit more organized about what, what you actually want to get um, okay. but it's not very detailed it's, it doesn't say like hey wide opening shot of this to close shot of uh, this guy doing it's not it's not a storyboard in that sense it's yeah. it just more pictures and then some comments of what we want to achieve there and while we're to still have the effect to still make sure we are able to do the same kind of editing um, we usually have a lot of cameras on okay. that set then and um, so we have the ability to cut in, in in a variety of angles and maybe there's always one camera that just sits somewhere does a time lapse and yeah. then there's a camera that does this and uh, one camera does a lot of crazy movements one camera is very straight um, most of the time the main camera so I just make to, uh, try to make sure to, to 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 gather a lot so we can still achieve the the dynamic editing, but at the same time plan in a way that a client and an agency can actually see that we're we are set up for success. I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you know what their end goal is. You know what they're trying to sell. You're not just out to make. Yeah, you're gonna hit the points that they need to hit. Um, and I would also imagine. Back in the day, you had four months to travel around and shoot these things, and now you're working with uh, really in-demand people. You're shooting with Chris Burkhardt. He probably only has like a day and a half to go shoot with you. So that is that why you need the multiple cameras to try and get more shots? Yeah, and, and you just need to uh, be accepting of the fact that uh, sleep is not the most important part in your life anymore. <laughs> and... <laughs> It's very long days, and um, sometimes even, especially the film that we shot in Mexico, at some point, we had multiple crews, basically, and we just, because we only had one and a half days of good weather. Wow. So, at that time, we're just sending everyone in different directions in yeah. the city, and just like, hey, collect, 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 yeah. uh, because we don't have the luxury of for a month of traveling anymore, yeah, as you say, and you need to 
be ready to make the most out of it and yeah. also add some stuff that um, that you can always have on the side. I mean, we, we shot some some more abstract details for these films as well. Yeah. Um, some studio stuff. And, yeah, I noticed and, that in the uh, Mexico video, I assumed kind of the, the beans and stuff, the different ingredients being thrown around, I assumed you would yeah. have done that afterwards. We did it afterwards, yeah, just yeah. In, a, in a somewhat studio setting and in Hamburg and yeah. just to f fill things up and, 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 and be sure you have enough interesting footage to go with it. Also, with these kind of films, I mean, we're trying to tell a story, so you can't just like run around and film a city yeah. and expect to have all the footage that you need to tell this particular kind of story. Yeah. Um, I like both. I mean, I, I, I didn't think I would enjoy this kind of work that much as well, but I'm very much looking forward to some kind of a longer travel experience on my own again or with yeah. my friends. Um, I didn't have that for quite some time. Yeah, yeah, it'll feel good when you work. finally get it. And uh, yeah, so for people that don't know what we're referring to when we're talking about the Mexico video, we're talking about the Life Changing Places campaign. Uh, that you just did and can you run us through how you got that campaign and uh, what the experience was like shooting that um it was i think the campaign was out in the commercial industry for a while like they were looking for a, a lot of directors and um i don't know i i don't know the whole story behind it but the client was never really happy they don't want it something else something fresh and okay. um i guess last minute one of the production one of the production company from hamburg um came up with the idea to throw me in the race and um it, it really just took a couple of days like from my from the first call like hey would you be interested in that um five six days later it was like all right you're gonna be working for two months on this project all over the world and I'm like oh, oh okay fine <laughs> um, this, is, this is very exciting but also I mean it's a big big project and I was quite humbled I'd yeah. say yeah. And, and, uh, and a little scared as well to just like, um, like can I do this like do I, do I actually know what I'm doing here what were the main things you took away uh, if you look kind of what you were thinking going into it and then what you learned coming out of it. That it's, it's, it, it it's a tough job. It's, um, it's different than making these films than what, what, what we are doing. Yeah. Um, mostly because there's just so many more people involved that have some sort of opinion on how this should be and um but once you learn to deal with that that did you, you did, this is a team effort now you have to work with a lot of people then that's fine and i think um as long as you have the confidence that um that you know how your film should look like yeah um people generally really trust you and give you the give you the freedom to to do whatever you want and i was surprised by that like in a, I, I sometimes also have the feeling oh maybe i have to do this and then they destroy my film because it should look a totally different way but um it, it was not like that um they really gave, gave me a lot of freedom and i think a, a very positive takeaway is also that when you feel this pressure all the time um it it also kind of motivates you to move to the next level step, yeah. go to the next level and step it up a little um other than hey we already have this nice time let's let's go home yeah. like it's it's always like what else could we do to make this a little bit more special um and that's a good takeaway um yeah. but it is <laughs> Uh, usually those travel films are a lot more fun. Um, yes, yeah. I would not say that um, 
I mean, I enjoyed my time in these places, but I, I would not say that my time in Mexico City, for example, was any sort of holiday. Yes, yeah. No, <laughs> that's that's totally gone. Like, back then when we did this travel films, there's fun, there's going out, there's uh, a good time and, 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 and enjoying the culture and the country. In this line of work, not so no. much. Any. No, 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 no. So after an experience like that, where I know what you mean, it, it was... It wasn't the same as your travel films, but you're not complaining. You you enjoyed the experience of making the films, but do you do you feel like you still have kind of a fire to go travel personally, or are you a little bit burnt out uh, from all the travel? It, it's a bit of a sacrifice constantly traveling the world. Um, yeah, it totally is, and it, it sometimes sounds stupid for other people, but yes. yeah, I, yeah, I sometimes really... Uh, tell my friends that like I'm really fed up with being on in airplanes and I don't want to do this anymore I just want to stay at one place for a little while yeah um, and I do have that feeling now especially because I I just recently like spent more time here in New York and yeah I, I, I am enjoying that I can actually be here and not leave every every other week yeah. um, but I do have the the I do have that urge to do my own travels again um, in the future. Um, it, I want to do all these things that are a little bit different or more difficult and not like these tourists, at maybe no more Southeast Asia, but something more <laughs> along the lines of whatever Greenland or something. Yeah, where it's yeah. These kind of things I want to do, but I also want to do it with some of my best friends again. Sure. And they're a little bit held up by um, their Life. recent family family devo developments. Yeah, I guess people are growing up, eh? <laughs> <laughs> people are growing up, uh, but I'm pretty sure that the time will come back. Um, yeah. Right now, I think I'm more focusing on these smaller trips and kind of developing my filmmaking a little bit um, in different ways. Um, I don't want to be doing for the rest of my life just little music-driven travel films that's sure. not i mean that that's cool and that's fun but that that shouldn't be everything yeah so um, the uh there's one video of yours i really like the uh the story of a solar fridge and is that kind of the direction you're looking to head so and if could you kind of give a brief description of that video sorry can you uh repeat the question you were just breaking up oh sorry yeah the story of a solar fridge uh the that's on your Vimeo for people to check out. It's a great story. I was just wondering if you could give a description of that video, and I was wondering if that is kind of the way you're looking to head with your films, because I know that had a pretty big impact. Yeah, so I, uh, one of the guys in a marketing of an NGO called Medair uh, is apparently a big fan of my traveling work. And is also um, kind of like getting into filmmaking himself a little bit. Okay. And he really randomly called me up um, and said, "Hey, would you ever be interested doing something with an NGO?" And then he, I, I thought about it and was like, "Yeah, okay." And um, they invited me to go to Lebanon, close to the Sy Syrian border, to do something with um, the refugees who were pouring in from from the war. And that was a just a quick idea. There was nothing planned about that f film, really. So I was just going there with a friend of mine for four days and documenting the life there. And uh, but the the NGO really liked the work that we did there, and um, so they decided to invite me again um, for a more thoroughly planned um, project, which was in Congo where they do a lot of work to help uh, ensure medical conditions for the um, people who live in very remote places there. So one of the stories was that um, they need, a lot of these villages need fridges for, um, to keep the vaccines cold. I mean, the vac just bringing the vaccines there doesn't do much because they yeah. just, with all the heat, they just grow bad. So we basically said we're going to document the whole process of getting that fridge into that very remote village because 
the process is crazy. You, the way you have to drive there, the roads, the conditions, and then carrying it through the jungle yeah. is a, one of the hardest filming experience I ever had. I mean, A, because I was just alone. I, as I'm the cameraman, I'm oh, trying yeah, to do everything. everything and, yeah. and when those people run around the jungle um, carrying a fridge and you said, hey, please wait. Um, can we do that scene again? No one's listening to you. So you have to, um, you have to document everything while it's happening. There's no retakes or anything like that. Um, that's challenging. And obviously the food situation, I got very fat, bad food poisoning, the, the heats, um, and the general safety, I guess too. Hey, I'm hearing some of the stories in that video. That is it's a very humbling experience. Yeah. After all the other travels that you did and feel like a great explorer. Yeah. Um, because you're driving with a car through Thailand. Um, that that's different. If you, if you get to a camp and they tell you to, to, to seal your windows with the, with the lead bars, um, before you go to sleep because there could be random fi gunfire at night is, is very different. And you see guns and military around you all the time. So it's, it's hard, yeah. uh, but you also surprisingly get used to it quite quickly. It's not that you're out there and, and be scared every, every minute of the day. I mean, you wouldn't be functioning otherwise. Exactly. You, like, okay, that, this is my situation now and I'm gonna deal with it. But there was no, there was no real dangerous situation we ran into, so that um, that was good. But yeah, I, I mean, back to the original question. This is certainly I want to do do um, more, but I guess it will always be some kind of a side yeah. endeavor because these kind of things are are important, but yeah. they will probably not pay your rent. Yeah, um, yeah. At the end of the day. Um, I, I, I really wish to do more like that and maybe a, my own projects as well for something that's dear to my heart, but um, certainly not the main, um, my, my main objective. Yeah, so how do you see your work evolving uh, or even kind of your life evolving? As you said, you don't really want to be doing the same travel videos for the rest of your life. So do you know yet or are you just kind of taking it month by month, year by year? Yeah, I'm taking as a as 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 it comes. I mean, I always change my mind so many times, and then I have a great different idea because I, I hear some kind of song that is very inspiring to do something very particular that I haven't thought of before. Yeah, or a job comes along that um, requires me to do something really different. I mean, the Mexico City film. I'm coming back to this one because it was very challenging for me in, on so many levels. It is about food. I, I don't like making films about food whatsoever. Yeah. I, I'm not a food person. I, when I heard the script, I was like, oh man, I'm going to struggle with this one. <laughs> but it was fun. I mean, yeah. it's a challenge. Like, and sometimes someone just presents you with a challenge and say, hey, all right, I'll try to tackle this and maybe it's fun. And there's other times when I'm doing a film and I'm like, I, I did not like that experience whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try try and see what, what's, what's coming up. But I really don't want to do traveling alone. I think everything will always be in that general sphere of inspired by the world, inspired by the by culture, inspired by people. Yeah. Um, a thing, and maybe a little bit narrative as well, but more on the documentary side, just inspired by what's actually happening out there. That's, um, that's that's it's still a very broad concept so yeah, i could yeah, imagine yeah. doing <laughs> doing doing many many different things yeah. um i don't but as i said i, I just don't want to be the tourist filmmaker that's yeah, yeah. um not 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 what i want to do the rest of my life yeah um yeah I'll, i have a few more questions i want to touch on before i let you go but uh sure yeah, we talked about sound at the start, but we were focusing mostly on kind of soundtrack. I want to talk about your sound design. Uh, just, you seem like a pro at it. I, I messaged you a while ago about it, and you, you seemed super chill about it, though. It's like you just kind of figured it out on your own. Um, how did you get better at sound design and sound effects? Uh, 
honestly really just learning by doing. There's no nothing that I learned that I looked up. Um, it was more, I think, the first time really in the South America video okay. where I tried, um, where I really wanted to go with this very, with the song, which is very quiet in the beginning and doesn't really have a rhythm whatsoever. And then I realized, like, okay, if I use this and I don't add anything else, yeah, it sounds empty. It's there's, and my thinking was always if I want to translate the experience that somebody has in Patagonia sound is a must because the wind you don't see the wind that much on film and it's for me my memory of patagonia is wind all the time in annoying <laughs> ways in in good ways too but most of the time in really annoying ways yeah. just trying to sleep there with the tent flapping right next to your head all the time it is such a strong experience that is hard to translate for other people and I always thought, okay, if I sound will be a really good vehicle to show that. So choosing a song that is not over overwhelming, where you can actually hear the sound. But then I realized most of the sound that we recorded was horrible. I mean, if it's very strong wind, you know, it's just like it will sound terrible exactly. in the camp. Yeah. So I went out of my way and like tried to find sound effects and like, oh, well, this is nice. And then while you're looking for sound effects, you find other nice sound effects and like oh this is good i could start, use this and then it kind of evolved with like hey this is re th th that makes sense if i'm doing this in this transition even if it's just a weird wind sound that doesn't have anything to do with wind or what what's going on in the in the in the picture but it just sounds cool as a transitional element and i'm like oh i could use it it was really playing around and learning um what works so sometimes i have seven seven audio tracks just for one transition because you it, it's like a mixing process you but one sound never really works most of the time so you just put on many many layers and yeah. all of a sudden something really cool comes it out it starts to sound oh, more full right if you have a shot yeah. of kind of a night sky it's like okay we'll throw in a light wind that on its own it's super unrealistic when do you just yeah. get wind okay let's throw in some crickets Let's throw in a different wind noise as well, and then you start to create this world, right? Roll. Oh, you were just breaking up yeah, again. Yeah, sorry, I lost you for a second there. Yeah. yeah, but also, like on the, I think especially the Japan one was one of the craziest ones where I, I just wanted this techy kind of feel. So it's there's a lot of typewriters office sounds everything like a copying machine and then you just layer that over each other one of the most used sounds is an umbrella opening really in the japan video huh. that's like on so many different um points but also always mixed up with something else and yeah. it's just as yeah things which they they don't relate to anything that no. you see but it just makes sense in the um for the transition so yeah it's just a lot of fun i i would say is, yeah. um for someone who enjoys editing but um, never really played around with the sound aspect of it i can only highly recommend playing around it's just so much fun and you you never really expect what's coming up and it's like oh i'll try this one over this one and like oh that yeah. sounds funny and sometimes even those sounds just give you an inspiration of what kind of shot you could use yeah, as the next yeah. one no i actually have you to thank for that i <laughs> like seriously started watching your work maybe like eight months ago and I've been paying so much more attention to my sound and been getting a really good response with it. I think it throws people into your work way more. Uh, than well, I'm glad I, yeah, so glad I had that. a little influence there. Yeah. And then, uh, one more question, uh, basically the gear that you use and kind of how you view gear, uh, is how important is it to you? I'm, I, I'm a nerd on so many levels in what, when it comes to editing. Uh, when it comes to gear, not much whatsoever. Okay. Um, I usually prefer to have one camera with a zoom lens um, that maybe has a um, ND, sh ND fader so I can work with most light conditions okay. and most 
that, that, that's what I like to be as as to have a, as simple as as possible setup. But most of the time, when I work for when I work with Clemens, um, especially or if I'm working in any kind of um, professional environment, there's a lot more nerding going on about what camera, what yeah. lenses, all these kind of things. But most of the time, I, I, I have someone on my team that thinks more about this aspect. I think my work is more specialized on where are we going, what are we doing, which angles, and, and how to set up these scenes. I'm not really into the whole what shutter speed, what are, I mean, I know all these things, but yeah. I'm not, I'm just generally not that um, interested and the, all these drone things that are coming up. I mean, I always have people who love this yeah. and who are nerding out about it and I'm glad that I have these people around me. Exactly, um, right, Because and, and then maybe they don't care about sound design at all or editing yeah. and that's where you come in. So that, again, yeah. going back to the team aspect of creating, it's super important, right? It is, and I think honestly, I I I, I don't say uh, a gear is not important or whatever. I see so many travel videos where people just use a GoPro. No, no, um, that's not <laughs> what I'm saying. So um, you should you should definitely think about what kind of lenses or what kind of framings, and and you should think about what you're doing there. And uh, just using an iPhone camera or a GoPro is not a solution. Um, I'm just saying. There is a lot more, or a lot. Uh, there's people around me, or in in general in this industry, who are um, way more concerned about the technical details yeah. um, than I am usually. I I'm just hoping that everything works correctly and works fast. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of uh, red cameras, for example, because I just don't like how long it takes to turn them on. Yeah. In a traveling environment, it's just shots will be will be gone by the time this thing just <laughs> I was trying to explain to a friend who isn't really into film they're asking why I like to shoot on kind of like A7S 2s and GH 5s why not get a red or do I want to get a red and the best explanation I could come up with I'm not sure if you agree is I think the GH 5 A7S 2s kind of get my work up to like a 90% maybe even higher like 93% level it, they'll work in 93% of the conditions that I shoot in. And then the red will cover that other 7%, right? And to me, what I lose in carrying that around, <laughs> what I lose in carrying around that red camera is not worth that extra 7% of conditions that I can shoot in. I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, there are always moments when all the A7S footage that we shoot in, it when we're in, in grading, then some somebody, most of the time the colorist says like, oh, this is horrible, yeah. like the dynamic yeah. range, it does, I can't really work with this. And all the Alexa footage, for example, is like, oh yeah, that's fine. Because it's just, I, these are the moments where you really know like, okay, there's some, some grain in the blacks and you kind of fucked it up there a little bit. And then if you, if, if you want to maximize this because it's going out to a cinema, then you realize, ah, okay, I see. Yeah. Um, there's cameras which are doing a better job, um, and you. But for most of the internet purposes, um, GH4 or uh, GH5 and A7S are doing a spectacular job, and I would always, always have an A7S on set, even if we're shooting with Alexa, because it's just so much more light sensitive. And if you're working mostly with natural light, um, even Alexa or Red cannot handle the the night vision aspects of the Sony A7S. So I, I always want one of these around me. Also, I think in traveling, in documentary work in general, a smaller camera alters the situation that you're in a lot less. You're yes. not, you're, you could be any kind of tourists and not like, not everybody is, is stopping what they're doing and looking at your big ass camera and, and is intimidated by it. So I think for travelers, it's, it's, it's very good to have a small device that doesn't look like a spaceship. 
Totally um, agree. I was just that, in Hawaii. Uh, we did yeah. this crazy long hike and ended up with this really strange hippie commune, and I wanted to make a film about it. And if I had had a massive camera, there's no way they would have been comfortable because they're completely off the grid. Uh, yeah. But I just had my tiny little setup, and it, it just looked like I was kind of... I didn't really yeah. know what I was doing, which was helpful. I think the best, the, the, the best mixture really is... Some of the scenes for the Lufthansa film, for example, I mean, some of the scenes are set up. We're alone somewhere in a, in a controlled environment. A big camera that does really good pictures is, is, is wonderful. That, that's what you need. And then there's other times when we're running around the city just to get random shots. And then, like, we, we're not even... We, we have the big camera, but we're not even bringing it. Yeah. So it's... For whatever, for whatever you're trying to do... Um, it's a big different answer to the question, but most of the times I totally agree with you. You can do 90% of the job with these cameras yeah. and don't need anything else. Yeah. And um, I love them. I, I personally love them. I, I'm never trying to film with an Alexa. I, I have no idea what, what <laughs> buttons to press. So I, yeah. I don't, I don't want to do that. Yeah. It's a pretty good time to be a creator right now. There's lots of, lots of tools and resources out there. So there's really no excuse. Yeah, especially for drones as well. Like the drone uh, development in the past few years is so amazing. You do, actually don't have to do anything anymore. It seems like with the Mavic, you just throw it out in the air and just flies on its own. Well, the new one's the size of an iPhone as well, so you yeah. can pretty much put it in your pocket and take it anywhere. And they're decent. I mean, not really good quality, but decent enough. Yeah, I mean, well, you'd you only do Mavic Pro for wide shots for some of yeah. your recent work, right? And it looked it looked amazing. I'm sure you had some good coloring. Yeah. I mean, it, for most of the last videos, it was just a Mavic app, yeah. so. That's very encouraging. It, All right, well, I've taken <laughs> enough of your time on this Monday. I'm sure you've got a lot of stuff to do. Uh, where do you want people to come? I'm playing tennis you? now. You're going to play tennis? Yeah. Isn't it cold in New York? You, I guess you guys have a lot of indoor tennis. No, it, 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 indoor, yeah. All right, well, you got it. You got to come up to Whistler. I got into tennis two years ago, and I'm getting pretty good, so we can have a little match out oh. here. <laughs> very very nice once I visit Whistler I'm, I'm, I'm trying to train a little bit more because I haven't been getting good yet alright we'll give you some time you, we can meet up in 8 months or so <laughs> nice sweet so uh, I guess best place to find you for those listening is Vimeo uh, I, I just lost you again oh sorry we're back now I think yeah, but I didn't hear what you were saying. Oh, sorry. I was just asking uh, uh, where you want people to find you for those that kind of want to dive into your work. Best place to check you out online? Uh, best place is just really my Vimeo page. I didn't manage to have any other website yet. I have a Facebook page as well, but it's uh, vimeo.com, Vincent Urban. Um, all videos that I really like are up there to find, and um, you don't need any more information than that. And just see the videos if you're interested. Sounds good. All right, well, it's the perfect time to wrap it up as we're losing video quality <laughs> right now and audio quality. But yeah, thanks so much for your time, man. And I'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, chat Bye. soon.